Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Harlan Kilstein. I'm the top dog at Doggington University. Don't tell that to my little Pomeranian, Kalba, because she thinks she's the top dog. Um, today, Doggington University is brought to you by the Doggington Post and Merrick Pet Care. Merrick is what Kalba begs for every day around 3 o'clock, and it's, you know, uh, she gobbles it down. And I feel real good about her gobbling it down because it's real food. Um, it's nothing contains anything that's dangerous, no byproducts, just the same kind of healthy food that if you were making food for, for your fur baby, that's the kind of food that, that you would make. Um, it's the best USDA product, and you know what? When you open it up and you smell it, it smells like real food. It doesn't smell like those cans of, that you want to turn your, your nose away from. So... Um, if your dog has any kind of, um, of, of problems, why not try Merrick and see if it goes go the problems go away. To learn more um, or join Merrick's Real Food Revolution, visit Merrick Pet Care on Facebook at facebook.com Merrick Pet Care. Now, um, Merrick is doing something really special. They've done it each of the webinars that we've taught, and they're doing it again today. Um, they're going to give someone who pays attention at the very end of the webinar, we're going to ask you something based on something that our um, guest says today, because the first person who gets the right answer uh, based on something Victoria says is going to win a 25-pound bag of new grain-free real Texas beef dog food. And at the same time, Merrick is going to give the equivalent in the winner's honor to National Mill Dog Rescue. So we are thrilled today to have a special, special guest. And that's why you're here. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to introduce our guest. Our guest today is Victoria Stillwell. She is a world-renowned dog trainer. She's best known as the star of the hit TV series, It's Me or the Dog. Victoria is a passionate advocate for positive reinforcement dog training methods, and she's an outspoken vocal opponent, opponent of dominance-based techniques. She's had two bestsellers. Her third book is called Train Your Dog Positively, uh, came out this year. I think I'm up and running. Hi, everybody. It is so good to be here and so good to be doing this, and I'm very, very excited about talking to everybody today. I have to say, this is my first webinar that I've done. I'm very used to doing seminars where I can actually see people. Um, but I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope that you get a lot of information. Um, and I've got quite a lot to say, so I don't know if we'll have time for questions by the end of it, but please send them in just in case we do. And I'll try not to go on too long. But really, my seminar today is all about, or my webinar is all to do with the power of positive training. And um, as you know, I'm very passionate about teaching dogs in a force-free, humane way. And we're going to explore what that means today. Um, my, I have a lot of people asking me, really, what is the definition of positive training? And for me, it's a couple of things. Well, maybe more than a couple of things. It's positive reinforcement, which is basically if you reward a behavior you like, there's a greater chance of that behavior being repeated. And that's a very simple synopsis of part of what I call positive training. But it's very, very powerful. And it's what thousands and thousands of trainers all around the world use in order to encourage and motivate dogs to learn. And I'm going to go into that a lot deeper as we continue. Part of the whole positive training as well is not just reinforcing a good behavior or behavior that we like, but it's also about um, negative punishment. Now, that doesn't mean punishment in the true sense of the word of forceful punishment. Negative punishment really means the removal or withholding of something that the dog wants or likes. And the reason why 
I think it's important that I say this is because a lot of people have this idea that positive trainers don't like to say no to their dogs. Um, and so I'm not one of those trainers that believes that you should never, ever, ever say no to your dog. I do believe that there has to be clear direction so that there can be clear understanding. And sometimes that means that I have to either take something away from my dog or it means that I have to ignore a certain behavior or redirect a behavior. So I do say no to my dogs. I will sometimes issue a vocal interrupter to redirect negative behavior onto something more positive. And that's that's as much as I do. That's that's really the negative punishment. Taking a treat or something or a toy or withholding that treat or toy until the dog gives you the kind of behavior that you want. Um, but positive training is more than just this. It's about changing the way a dog thinks, feels, and learns without the use of pain, fear, or intimidation. And I, again, I think that's really important because we're saying that yes, positive reinforcement, positive training is about positively reinforcing good behavior, withholding or ignoring or redirecting negative behavior, and um, part of positive training is changing the way the dog thinks and feels inside without the use of force. And this is what I think, why I think positive training is so powerful and so incredible and so effective is because we really can deal with so many different issues in dogs by using this whole methodology and the principles really work. But it's more than just, so positive training is more than just this. It's about building a solid learning foundation. And that is really going to be ultimately the way your dog learns and how your dog learns and the time you take to encourage your dog to learn really is going to set your dog up for success throughout life. And that's what positive training is doing. It's really giving your dog, your puppy or your dog that you've just rescued that comes into your home, a real positive learning foundation so that it can be successful in society. Because if you think about it, domestication, domestic dogs, live in our very strange homes with very strange two-legged species and it can be very confusing. So building up that solid learning foundation is vital. But also positive training builds confidence and security. And this is what we're aiming for, more mentally balanced dogs. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of dogs out there that suffer with aggressive response that are anxious that um, have various kind of fears and phobias and anxieties. There are some dogs out there that just cannot cope with living in a human domestic world. And there are dogs that try to cope, but sometimes they cope in the way we don't like. Sometimes they bite, sometimes they growl, sometimes they run away. And that's not socially acceptable in our society. And so what happens to those dogs? Those dogs end up in the shelter. Or worse, they're put down. And um, I think it's really important that building confidence and security really creates a dog that is more well-balanced. Um, positive training really helps dogs become mentally confident. And if you've got a mentally confident dog, then you've got a dog that doesn't suffer from fears and phobias and anxieties, like unfortunately so many dogs do. But understanding where dogs come from is also part of positive training. And again, we'll be going through a lot of these things, and I'm going to be giving you a few great training tips and some um, things that you might not know um, that could really help you with your relationship with your dog, or if you're a trainer or you work in shelter, 
or you're some other kind of animal care professional. But I really think it starts from here. Understanding where ducks come from and where they don't. Because this has caused so many issues. And I think this is the big discussion and argument in the dog training world today. And I might venture as far as to say this is the battle that's going on. Because there is um, a word out there called dominance. And the whole old idea of dominance has pervaded public consciousness to the point where it is really beginning to adversely affect people's relationship with their dogs. And the whole idea is based on, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more later on, that if your dog is showing negative behavior, it's trying to dominate you in some way. It's trying to be top dog, your boss, alpha, achieve higher rank in your family. And that's based on that whole idea, that whole theory is based on highly flawed research that was done and has since been proven to be just plain wrong. So um, I think decoding the D word is also all about positive, what positive training is about. It's about giving a better idea of what dominance is all about in the, in the dog's world, in the domestic dog world. So positive training is, um, in summary, the use of positive reinforcement, rewarding behavior you like, negative punishment, taking something away from a dog, or ignoring behavior or redirecting negative behavior onto positive. It's understanding how dogs think, feel, and learn. We're not just talking about learning as in learning theory, cause and effect. We're talking about a dog's actual cognition. Cognition, the way a dog perceives the world around them and um, the dog's intelligence. It's the avoidance of pain, fear, and intimidation during training, period. We don't use it. And it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching the smallest little puppy, the cutest little puppy, and I'm teaching toilet training, or I'm working with a severely aggressive pit bull or Great Dane or a large breed dog. I use positive training across the board. And so um, awareness of the dominance myth, I think, is also important because that's what we need to, what I'm doing in my work is trying to change the myths that are out there in the dog training world today that have caused so much damage and, and I think is a real tragedy. Um, and I wanted to do a few like fact versus fiction, common misconceptions about positive training. What you might have heard in the dog run or at the daycare or with your friends or you've read in books or seen on TV, people say our oh, positive reinforcement, hey, it doesn't work on the red zone and high drive working dogs. It doesn't. Um, red zone, I mean, you know, the aggressive dogs, the ones that have severe behavioral issues. Or, you know, positive reinforcement doesn't or positive training doesn't work on the high drive working dogs, military dogs, police dogs, detection dogs. I mean, if you've, if you've got one of these breeds, you've got to use leash jerks and yank em, crank em teaching and that kind of stuff in order to get that dog to really listen and behave. Well, again, that, that can be further from the truth. I, I work a lot with military dogs, with field dogs, um, and these are some of the most amazingly driven dogs that can be motivated by positive principles. And that's why that sort of that age-old argument of, hey, well, don't work on the working dogs is, is mute because it, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, it's this whole idea as well, this whole dominance myth that dogs that misbehave um, are trying to be dominant. Uh, that any, anything a dog does, like if a dog is on the sofa or on the chair and you come close to it and it growls at you, that it's trying to establish higher rank over you. Um, well, one of the reasons why dogs will growl when they're on the sofa when you come close to it is because it doesn't want to get off the sofa. It doesn't have this whole concept, this whole idea in its mind that 
I'm going to be of higher rank to you and therefore I will not get off the sofa. That's just a human idea of what the dog is potentially thinking. And um, I think it shows a great sort of human insecurity and weakness to, to, to think that and also a misunderstanding where the dog is definitely saying, yeah, go away from me. I want to stay on this sofa. But not because I want to achieve higher rank over you. It's because I'm comfortable here. I'm comfortable here and I fear my loss of comfort, my space, I need to protect it. And that is very, very basic and common sense of why a lot of dogs will do things because they, they want to stay where they are. They're comfortable and they don't want you coming and taking them off. Um, I think that, now, can we say that that dog is being dominating? Well, I want to say more than dominating is controlling. I think that that is a better word to describe this whole idea because, again, the dominance word has been so misused and so misunderstood. I don't really like to use it anymore. I like to call it controlling behavior instead. People also say, there are people out there who say dogs only respect leaders who assert their dominance, who I call them the Yankum Crankum trainers, who are out there jerking on the leash and helicoptering dogs and putting shot collars on dogs and restraining dogs using alpha rolls and all of that. Um, again, I my dogs respect me a lot. Um, I am their leader. I am their leader. I am their teacher. And the reason why they respect me is because they trust me. They know that I'm 100% loyal to them. They know that I will never hurt them and I make them feel good. And I don't just have easy dogs. I took in two dogs that were severely behaviorally compromised in many kinds of ways. And so I haven't had to assert my dominance. I lead my dogs and I influence my dog's behavior without the use of force. And that's what's so incredible because their behavior has changed. And so we'll be going into a little bit of that a bit later on. This whole idea that dogs are pack animals like wolves, and I say to you, as I said, they want to be alpha or top dog over their owners. We're going to be going into the whole idea of pack animal and pack leadership and pack concept. You might be quite interested to find out what sort of the, the, the more modern research has shown, um, which kind of completely negates this whole idea of the alpha and the top dog. Again, as I was saying, you know, we do use discipline. A lot of people think that positive trainers are just great at stuffing food in dogs' faces, but that we don't like to say no. Yeah, you know, we do like to say no. We do, and we will give boundaries because I think boundaries is incredibly important. And you know, in 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 so many ways, um, I'm the noise there. Okay, so whatever we can do to keep the banging while um, she's on the thing, that'd be great. Victoria is having some work done in her house, and it only always happens at the at the wrong time. She'll be right back with us. I'm right back here. It's okay. We've got about ten people in this house right now, doing different things. Some working on dog stuff. Some decorating the house. Some doing everything. So I'm afraid that just got a cross line on there. Um, so we do use discipline. I think boundaries is really important and to establish those. So we're not sort of namby-pamby soft um, kind of uh, people. Um, training the treats is bribery. I hear this a lot that, you know, your dog should work for you because it loves you and that if you give it rewards, that's just bribing your dog. Well, again, I don't agree and I'm going to sh um, share with you some amazing facts about how powerful reward is in motivating your dog to learn and how powerful food, for example, is in allowing your dog to learn and be successful. Um, now, people say, okay, well, fine. We understand there's a positive training out there, but you know, hey, it's a, it's a free country. We can use any kind of method we want. And there's, there's, there isn't a right or a wrong method. Well. I would say there are lots of amazing methods within the whole scope of positive training. There's incredible methods that can be used like clicker training and um, lure and reward and 
um, catching behaviors and shaping and all of this amazing stuff. Um, but with regards to a principle, I don't buy it that there's more than one way to train a dog. Under the label of positive reinforcement, under the principles, yes, there's in incredible ways. But I think now we're talking morality here, we're talking ethics. And I think um, to be a really good dog trainer, in, in, with what we now know, I think we have to say goodbye to this whole yankum crankum devastating dominance where you dominate your dog into submission idea. Um, and so some people again think, well, then I'm not balanced. I'm not a balanced person and that there are other trainers out there that will use a more balanced approach. But I think my approach is actually very balanced. I think that because I do utilize boundaries, but I also utilize positive re reward. And so I utilize a whole load of amazing techniques that can encourage dogs to learn and can change difficult behaviors. So I think in that way, I'm very open. But I do think now we have a moral and ethical responsibility to treat our dogs with the respect they deserve. Science is teaching us now that Dogs are more like humans than we could even ever imagine. They're still very much dogs, but the similarities demonstrate and show us how important it is that we treat dogs kindly and humanely. And, um, and that morally and ethically, we must do this because confrontational training methods, dominant training methods, have caused so much aggression. Trainers like myself are picking up the pieces every day. And this is what really concerns me because it's all about safety in the end. Safety for the dog, but also safety for the people who have to live with dogs. And especially our children. And now we're seeing more and more dog bites. We're seeing more and more children getting badly, badly bitten by dogs. And I think one of the reasons behind that is because of confrontational training methods that have gleaned a certain kind of glamour, a certain kind of notoriety that is, has set modern day dog training and uh, that's based on behavioral science and positive training back 40 years. And it's something that, you know, that, that we, we really can't, we have to know that's out there now um, and we have to guard against using the dominance and go forward into using positive training. So what is dominance? Well, the real definition of dominance is a social relationship between species. And so dominance really was first discovered or as a concept during the 1920s um, and 30s when researchers observed chickens and the sort of the social order of chickens, the way they pecked each other, the way they controlled each other's space. And so since then, throughout um, many, many years since the 1920s and 30s, um, dominance, various animal species have been taught, or have been, have been studied, and we have seen how dominance relationships, social relationships, um, occur between various species, from humans to chimpanzees to dogs to rats to chickens. And so that's dominance. Now, dominance can be where uh, status and rank is important, but when we're looking at the, at the domestic dog, dominance is more about controlling behavior. And it's designed to ensure safety, survival, and access to valuable resources. Whether those resources are food, whether the resources is a location, a person, or whether that resource is a mate. It's controlling what is around you and being able to have a relationship with another 
being of your own species or another being of a different species. That is a functional relationship that ins also ensures your survival. Because that's basically the through line with all animals, including humans. We are pre-programmed to ensure our safety, to survive, and so that we protect our access to valuable resources. And we do that whether we're dogs, whether they're dogs, or whether we're humans. For example, with humans, we protect our resources. We alarm our homes. We protect our pocketbooks, our purses. We um, protect our children. We lock our cars. That's all about ensuring that we're safe. If we didn't lock our car, somebody might be able to steal it. Therefore, we wouldn't be able to get around. We wouldn't be able, we might have to walk home. That might compromise our safety. And the same thing with dogs. Really controlling behavior, like that dog's on the sofa, saying, please go away, this is my comfort. I feel good sitting here, and I don't want you near me. That dog is being controlling. That dog is not trying to assert its rank over you. So as I said, dominance exists, but not in the way most people think. And it's the human misinterpretation of animal social relationships that has caused such a problem and has led to very dangerous techniques promoted by dominance trainers. And I think it's important that we go through this because this whole idea of positive training versus dominance training, um, it can be very confusing. So I hope that I'm making it a bit clearer for you. But these dangerous techniques, are a couple of examples. Yank the dog harshly if he pulls or use a choke, prong, or shock collar. Um, knee a jumping dog in the chest. Keep the dog behind you when you go through a door. Punish your dog for eliminating in the home. Punish your dog for destroying your personal possessions. Put a spray or shock collar on the dog to stop it from barking. Ignore the dog completely whenever he demands affection. Punish the dog by jabbing him with your fingers. Kick or nudge the dog in the ribs with your feet. Alpha roll the dog on his side, which means restraining your dog on his back or side if he aggresses or behaves in a manner that you don't like. Holding him down until he submits to you. These are all techniques that are promoted by dominance trainers. And every one of these techniques should never ever be used. The whole idea of ignoring your dog completely whenever he demands affection, even though I say that I do ignore, let's say a dog's jumping up on me, I will turn around and ignore that behavior and wait till the dog has four on the floor before I give the dog attention. I don't completely or never give, in, give the dog affection when the dog demands it of me. If my dog comes up and says, I wanna have a cuddle, fine. We'll I will. I'll, I, I believe that I don't always have to start it. I love the fact that Sadie and Jasmine come up to me and want to be close to me and want to be touched and want to be petted. And, and that's what relationship is all about. So all of these techniques, please, please, please don't use them. Get rid of your choke collars. Get rid of your prong collars. Get rid of the shock collars. All of these devices are, are so counterproductive to actually teaching dogs um, and cause pain, they cause fear, they cause anxiety and it um, doesn't matter what people out there say there's now study upon study upon study, you can look it up, just google it you'll see so many studies that are saying why you shouldn't use these contraptions anymore man-made devices, the quick fixes that just dogs, if you ask them, will say please just take off me um, keeping a dog below you, denying access to high places, all of these kind of things. Um, you, you don't need to keep your dog below you. You don't need to deny them access to high places. 
But if your dog is growling on the sofa or your dog is growling and won't let you into bed, then you have to either manage the situation by not allowing your dog access to the sofa or the bed, or teach the dog to get off the sofa or get off the bed on your cue, um, and gradually build up that if your dog does react in a negative way to you when you come to him on the sofa, he doesn't, have, he doesn't get to go on the sofa, period. No grabbing him, pulling him off, any confrontation at all, because that's just going to exacerbate the situation e even more and make the behavior even worse. Um, okay, I'm so sorry, I'm going to just stop this a second. Um, I just wanted to show you this um, video with one family who had this wonderful English Bull Terrier called Dakota, and um, some of the techniques that was used by this family and also another family on their dogs, and you'll hear what I said to them. I hope you can um, hear the video and see the video well enough. But um, I've, I've just a couple of the things that, that you shouldn't do. So how would you try and get her to stop? What would she do? Like when she's getting like this, I'll, yeah. sometimes I'll just grab her. Um, I'll try and I'll try and get her to I'll try and get her to calm down this way. You know, sometimes sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know. When you hold a dog down like that, people think that dog's coming down, but actually the dog's not come down at all. What they do is they shut down. They learn, and instinct tells them they're being put in a compromised position. So in order to survive, they shut down. When Joe gets angry, he slaps her, and he doesn't just tap her. I heard the connection of his hand to the bone on her nose, and it was hard. People who use this kind of punishment for their dogs don't realize that they're actually making the behavior worse. And they actually only make an insecure dog even more insecure. So, um, are dogs on a quest for world domination? Well, in a word, no, they're not. I think if you were to ask the dog, um, that it would let you know that actually it just needs to control environment in order to be safe and survive. And so therefore I think controlling behavior is a better term than dominance. I think dominance is still a good word, but because of the misinterpretation misunderstanding, um, when you use that word, everybody thinks of alpha and top dog and all of that, and they've really lost what the true meaning of the word is, which remember, again, is a social relationship between species, um, between animals of the same species or animals of different species, um, and it's controlling behavior in order to be safe and survive. So yes, if you ask the dog, we're just trying to cope with a crazy human world, think about it. We are strange two-legged creatures that don't speak their language, that are very inconsistent, that um, ask them to do strange stuff, ask them to toilet outside when it's cold and when it's wet and when it's snowing or when it's too hot, um, get angry with them when they somehow do a behavior that we obviously don't like. There's a lot of pressure on dogs to cope in our domestic worlds and that's why I think positive training is so great because it allows dogs to be able to be successful. Um, and if you've ever heard the one about dogs that go through dogs' doors, um, sorry, that should say doors, before you are being dominant, um, or uh, walking ahead of you on the leash, they're being dominant, or, as I said, growling when you get off on the sofa, or jumping up on people. Look, let's just take dogs that are walking on the leash in front of you, okay? Um, there's that whole idea of the dog is walking in front of you, it's trying to be pack leader. No, it's not. It's walking in front of you because it's got four legs and you've got two and its pace is naturally faster than yours. Plus, it's excited to get to where it wants to go, but it's got this annoying leash, this rope that is stopping him from doing it. That's it. There is no high idea of taking over the world, of dominating the human being, of achieving higher rank. If it goes out through a door ahead of you, that's fine, as long as it's safe. Dogs want to get to where they want to go to. They're excited to get out of the door. Just sometimes it's just not safe. 
So we have to teach a dog to sit and stay by an open door so that we can go out and then call them to us so they don't run out in the, uh, in the road in front of us. That's it. We don't have to do it because we think a dog is being dominant. When a dog jumps on you, maybe the dog is being controlling sometimes because it's just insecure. Who are you coming into my house? Or they're just jumping on you because they're so excited to see you. Look, a lot of human body language and dog body language is exactly the same. When we're excited, do we sometimes jump up and down, move around a lot, and make noise? Well, that's what dogs do. They jump up and down and bark when something new comes through the door. And they're excited to see you, yet sometimes we punish the dog for doing it. That This is why we've really got to a true understanding of why dogs do things is so important. And I just want to say now, it's 5.40. We're going to be here for a while because I want to get to great training tips and, and a lot more about understanding dogs. So I do hope that you'll stay on after 6 o'clock because the way I'm going on at the moment, uh, we will be here for a, a, a bit of a longer time. So um, I want to show you a video of Niles. And again, it's this dog is, is highly aggressive. Um, and it's funny in parts, the, 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 what the woman has to do in order to be able to walk her dog and touch her dog. But it's also really sad to see a dog that is so compromised. But listen to what the lady, who is a lovely lady from Birmingham, England, says. Listen to how she defines what she thinks her dog is doing. Um, and watch Niles. As, as you're watching this video, try and figure out what Niles is trying to say. Because that's what understanding our dogs is all about, is understanding how our dogs are communicating to us, what their vocalizations mean, what their body language means. So um, I, will, I will pause the video and um, take you through some things in slow motion so you get a better idea. And then see what you think. Make your judgment about why Niles is doing what he's doing. And then you'll hear what I think. And then you'll hear, um, obviously, what the lady thinks. So here we go, Niles. Meet Karen Fletcher. She's always been a cat lover. <laughs> I love cats. I mean, I've always had cats for years and years, and they've always been like babies to me. But one day, her beloved cat died. I'd had him 22 years, and it, it was really awful. Karen couldn't bear to get another cat, so she bought a dog instead. The reason I've got Niles is because he's about the same size as a cat, and I really thought that he would behave like a cat. She even tried treating him like a cat. It was no surprise things started to go wrong. And Karen is now at the end of her rope. Come on, now. Come on, my little boy. Niles hasn't responded well to Karen's affection. I actually think that Niles does actually hate me. He's so vile. And you'll, you'll see yourself how vile he is. In fact, Niles won't even let Karen anywhere near him. Especially when it comes to taking walks. Oh, well, to walk. <laughs> Do I have to get the blankets? <laughs> okay, get the blankets. Naughty boy. If I can try and pick him up. Yeah, get in, get in quick. Silly. <laughs> This will go on all day. That's the sit, that's it. Back to the setter, you want the setter. Come on, don't hurt him. Touch him, touch him. Come on, come on, come on. Niles' aggressive attitude is having a terrible impact on Karen's social life. She's virtually become a prisoner in her own home. I'm scared of him. And my friends and family are also scared of him. I want you to take a look at Niles' face. Look at the tension on his face. Look at the eye. That's called whale eye. When a dog is so stressed out, keeping its um, eyes on 
Karen, but trying to turn his head away um, in case she starts to go for him again. He's trying to give her an appeasement gesture. Um, you can see how his lips are pulled back, how his teeth are, are exposed. This is a dog that is really tense. And yes, a lot of people would look at it and say this is a really nasty dog. But I actually, Niles is one of my favorite dogs ever because I loved him because he was such a great, not just vocal communicator, but also physical communicator. I can't believe he's just done that. He's just um, relieved himself on the corner of my bed. Now, can you see Niles' lifted paw? This is another expression of um, appeasement. I call it the anticipatory paw, where um, a dog will lift its paw as if anticipating what is going to happen next. And you'll find that dogs that are put in a compromised situation or are unconfident do this a lot. It's a real signal, as well as elimination. Now, Niles wasn't being spiteful by eliminating on Karen's, or by the side of Karen's bed. It was an expression of his anxiety, and many animals will eliminate like that because of anxiety. Of course, there are some dogs that will eliminate in the house from because they're not properly house trained or because they have scent marking issues, but Niles wasn't one of them. Look what you've done. Naughty boy. Next, they enjoy some grooming time. It's very, very uncomfortable. You can see Niles' body is very small. His ears are back. He does not like that no. at all. Not at all. Then Karen tries to pet Niles. Go on, then you try. Then she tries again. What's the matter? Come on. I want you to watch Niles' tongue. Here you can see Niles doing the tongue flick. Lip licking, which is another expression of stress. You naughty boy. Now Niles is doing what we call the shake off. You can see him in slow motion shaking off. As Karen leaves him, he shakes off like he's trying to get water off his back, but that's getting rid of all the build up of adrenaline and anxiety that Could he's felt. Can you show me then how you put the lead on? <coughs> I'll certainly try. I'm just go and get the lead. Come on, then. Wanna go for a walk? Good boy. Go on, then. No, it's not. Come on, then. All right, all right, it's okay, it's okay. Careful, Mom. Oh, all right, all right, it's okay, it's okay. It's gotta be seen to be loaded. Come on, then. Get his back, get his back. Pick him up, pick him up. Excellent. Okay, and then... You don't take him for walks right. very often. No, no. Just keep holding him on first. I need to try and get something then to actually turn the collar around to the back of his neck. I mean, you see, it's like a military operation, to be honest. Oh, good boys. I know he's so silly. Just keep holding him on first. There's no need for all this, is there? And I think we have success now. That's it. You can drop him down, Mum. There you go. Why do you think he's behaving like that? I personally think he's not the boss anymore. I've got like a little step over him. Okay. So he don't like it. I don't think he's trying to be boss. He's trying to tell you to back off. Everything in his body language is communicating this to you, but you're ignoring him. That is why he's aggressive to you, because he doesn't want you to keep coming up towards him and touching him. That's what's happening here. Oh, I'm actually quite shocked. I'm surprised, because, you know, I was absolutely convinced that it was, you know, a, a major dominance problem. Um, and there you go. Look, dogs aren't coming into our home trying to be top dog or alpha. Um, they know we're humans. We're not two-legged dogs. Um, Therefore, this whole idea of being the leader of their pack is, uh, I think, strange. I think you should be a leader, but not necessarily a pack leader, because we're not part of their packs. They know we're different as we know they're different. Um, 
we can't trick trick them into thinking we're pack leaders, so let's stop trying to convince dogs that we're one of them. Um, but how do hierarchy and rank really work? Even if you've got one dog in the household or you've got a multi-dog household, how does it really work? Well, it's based on an individual dog's value systems. What does a dog value? Does a dog value location? Does it value space? Does it value a person more? Does it value food or an object or a toy? Some dogs that value their space, a location, their bed, don't care about food, whereas the other dog in the household um, really cares about the food and values, about values and will fight over the food, but couldn't care less about the bed. So if you have a well-functioning gr group of dogs in your household, it functions because they all accept each other's priority access to resources that they that are important to them. Problems can occur when two dogs place equal value on something. So they can disagree over it because one wants primary access and the other one does too. Um, and therefore, hierarchies within a home, they're not fixed. They're fluid. Remember, we're talking about a group of domestic dogs in your home where they're not thinking about how I'm going to be top rank, where they're thinking about how they're going to be safe and survive, and where there's no one alpha that's going to control everything. But depending on the dog's value systems, one will be more controlling over one thing, whereas another is going to be more controlling over another. The whole idea of pack comes from the whole dogs are wolves, but they are a different species, of course. The wolf is the domestic dog's ancestor. However, that's basically where it stops because they've been separated by 15,000 years of evolutionary changes. Dogs are not socialized wolves, so we mustn't treat them like, like wolves. And there's a big difference between a wolf pack and a group of domesticated dogs. Okay? So in the true pack, you've got mom and dad, offspring, and immediate family. That's a true wolf pack or a true dog pack. But when you're talking about dogs that are in our homes, they don't form packs. They're more loose, fluid groups. And so that's why I say being pack leader that don't really work. Being a teacher, being an educator, yeah. Being your being a just a leader, yeah, but pack leader? No, no, no. But how did we get here? Well, the domestication process of fifteen thousand years or more, depending on what studies you believe, um, has really changed dogs in so many ways. But the whole idea of pack leadership and alpha and dominance came from very flawed studies um, of wolves in the 1970s where um, a group of or, or wolves from different packs were taken and forced to live together in an unnatural environment and the relationships between them were viewed by researchers and then applied to the domestic dog. Well of course if you're going to take dogs from uh, wolves from different packs and get them to live together in an unnatural environment, what's going to happen? Some are going to defer naturally in order to survive and others are going to fight and there's going to be violence. So observing that and taking that as your model of how you need to be with your dogs and how dogs interact with each other is just flawed. And that's the tragedy because this did just tell us or, or demonstrate in some weird way of how dogs interact with each other, but also how we should interact with our dogs. And therefore, it, it was very violent. Um, but we now know, we now know better. You don't have to be violent to your dog in order to get your dog to behave. Um, if you misdiagnose the condition, you're going to prescribe the wrong treatment. And Punitive training really emphasizes what not to do, but positive training 
helps the dog learn and understand what to do. That's what we put the emphasis on. Part punitive training can be very dangerous. It exacerbates, it, it exacerbates aggressive response. More dogs bite because of it. It causes shutdown. Shutdown is where a dog literally cannot learn because it's so stressed and so anxious. Um, it doesn't allow dogs to think for themselves and problem solve. And dogs are incredible thinkers and incredible problem solvers if you just let them. And it shows that you're the bully. Let's talk about it. Yeah, there are some dogs that are bullies. There are some dogs that are controlling. There are some dogs that are just, you know, that are, that are difficult. They can be jerks. But really, is that dog a confident dog or is that dog insecure? Think about the bully kid in the playground. Is that a secure kid or an insecure kid? If your dog is bullying other dogs and you're trying to tell it off and be dominant over it, well, you're actually making an insecure dog more insecure by using punitive and forceful tactics. I believe that discipline should be used to guide, not to instill fear. And so the techniques that I had talked about is all you really need of ignoring, redirection, um, removal, doing timeouts, removing the dog from something or removing a treat or reward is all you really need to um, teach dogs what to do and what not to do. Sometimes I'll do a vocal interrupter like an ah-ah uh -uh, to redirect negative behavior onto behavior that's more positive. Um, Dogs and kids, they're more similar than you think. Look, sometimes people get mad at me when I say this, but look, I'm a mum too. I have a child. I get it. Um, and I, I've raised my child using a lot of the behavioral principles that I used to raise dogs too. And look, modern science is now showing us some amazing things that um, dogs have now. We know the cognitive abilities, the learning, problem-solving abilities of a two-year-old child, of a toddler. And um, they have their dogdom too, so their own set of skills that can take them far beyond a two-year-old child. But in cognition and abilities, it's basically a toddler. And so therefore, when you punish or you violence or you put a prong collar or a shock collar on that dog, I'm going to say it right now. It's like you're putting it on a two-year-old child. And for people out there who might think, oh, that's, that's a bit much, I don't think it is. Research is showing us dogs have emotions. Dogs have the same physiological reactions to pain as we do. Dogs um, have the same biological reactions to fear and joy and excitement as we do. And now we know they have the cognitive abilities of a toddler. It makes it even more important that we treat them right. Um, I do call these evil two tools. Again, I'm going to go through very fast. Shock collars, prong collars, electric fences. Get rid of them. Um, electric fences themselves, not just the shock components. So many dogs, and I work a lot with animal control here where I live, and um, animal control is always picking up dogs every day that have run through their fences with their collars on. Um, and then, of course, the dog's been shocked, so they're frightened so they don't come back. Also, electric fences don't stop a dog from... Um, running and barking and uh, running along the fence line and barking at passers-by, nor does it stop people coming onto the property, nor does it stop people from stealing the dog. So there's a lot of reasons why I don't like using electric fences. Um, we're, um, I think the differences between positive and traditional training really is this. Positive trainers use force-free methods not only to reinforce good behavior but to discipline as well. Um, and bullying tactics really promote confrontational relationships. They make aggression problems worse. And here is it. Here it is. Behavior is more predictable with positive training methods. That's it. Um, it really is. I want to know or have more indication of how my dog is going to behave in certain situations. And I'm going to have more of that indication when I really understand and truly know how my dog is going to react in certain environments. Um, and around certain stimuli. And so positive training helps a dog's behavior become more predictable, realizing that no behavior is 100% is predictable. You can never say that a dog won't bite tomorrow or that won't uh, feel sad or moody tomorrow, but you can have more of, of an indicator. Um, 
traditional training, um, positive training is safer, more user friendly. I think that as well for families, for people to do it. There's no good a trainer coming in and dominating the dog and yanking and cranking them and showing how tough they are. If the if and then leaving the family, my gosh, we do we we don't want to do this to our dog and pe we're getting bitten in the process. That's why positive training is um, really much more user friendly. I don't want to suppress behavior. I really want to change it. You can punish a dog all day if you like, and yeah, the behavior might change, probably will change, in the fact that it's suppressed. But you don't change the way the dog feels inside. The dog is going to feel potentially more insecure, but you're not going to change it in a positive way. That's why um, positive training really allows you as your owner to be more proactive than reactive. Um, and so that's really the differences between dominance training and positive training. Um, and I hope that I've made that definition and the differences really clear. Um, I want to continue this now, and again, I know that we're up to 6 o'clock, but I would like to continue if you all want to stay with me and just go through um, a little bit more about dogs and about how they perceive the world and think and feel. So um, if you got time, I've got time, and uh, let's continue. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the bond. Let's just ask everybody, ask everybody, how many people how many people want Victoria to go on? Type it in. <laughs> uh, there's nobody saying no. They'll stay okay. on forever. They'll stay on Thank forever. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, because I'm just getting into this. You know, when people come to my seminars, they come out with a lot of information. They come out tired, too, so... Um, we're learning a lot here, but uh, this is great, and I wish I could see you all. Um, thank you again for so much for taking the time to come and listen to me and, and hang out um, on the web with me. Uh, and um, thank you also for, for hosting this as well. We uh, really appreciate this um, for, the, for the wonderful university that we have online here. So, all right, I want to talk about the bond because it's a mutual mutual beneficial relationship that is unique among animals. This is what we have with dogs. All right. Um, why do we have this bond? That's what I asked and I've been asking for years. Why do humans and dogs have such amazing bond like this? Well, it's really due to their social evolution. Dogs have evolved with us for thousands and thousands of years. They have protected our livestock, protected our properties. Um, protected us. They've been our first alarm systems. They've been our sewage systems. They've consumed all our, our all our rubbish. They they have protected us and been our companions, and and helped us in so many ways. And whilst they've been doing this, they have really grown to really listen and watch and understand our social cues. Dogs are one of the only species that can follow, for example, a human point. Not even our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, can do that. When we point to something, a dog will follow the direction of where your finger is pointing to and will look at where you are also looking and pointing at. And that is something that is incredible in this species. Um, and that has evolved from social learning, from dogs watching us and picking up our cues. Um, safety and survival is really important for these dogs to understand our social cues, to keep them safe and to survive. And really, you have to hand it to the dog, don't you? They are they are the one of the most successful species on the planet. Why? Because they've aligned themselves with the one species that could have made them extinct, and that is man. So I'd say kudos to the dog. That shows intelligence. But I want to talk about the role of oxytocin. Oxytocin, what is it? It's the bonding hormone. Think of the mum who has just had her baby and is looking down at her baby and feelings of love and attachment flow from her to her baby. That's because she is having an increase of oxytocin in her body. And that bonds her to her baby. Well, studies have shown now that when we look at our dogs, 
we have a surge of oxytocin that goes through our body. But what's even more incredible is that when dogs look at us and they're petted by us and we come through the door at the end of the day, they also have a surge of oxytocin that goes through their body. That oxytocin hormone, that hormone bonds us, attaches us, and is also vital for emotional memory as well. Because if that dog didn't have the hormone in their body, it would be harder for that dog to recognize who you were. So oxytocin is really powerful, and it's one of the ways, one of the reasons why we're so bonded with these animals. But also, it gets even more fascinating, because here we have left gaze bias. Studies have been done in many different places, um, including the University of Lincoln, where um, dogs, when you look at a human face, you will find that your gaze starts on the left-hand side of a person's face, but lands very quickly on the right-hand side of a person's face. That's called left gaze bias. And why is that? because the right-hand side of a person's face shows their emotions more clearly than the left-hand side of a person's face. What is the only other species in the animal world that does this? The dog. Doesn't happen when a dog looks at other objects or looks at the face of another dog, but it does happen when dogs look at human faces. Why? Because they better know how you think and feel, just in case you're angry with them so they can get out there Remember, they have evolved to read our social cues. Why? To be successful, to be safe, and to survive. So how do dogs learn? Well, in many, many different ways. Genetics, of course. Genetics really, how a dog is genetically predisposed will either make learning easy, make learning more hard, or will allow a dog to learn in a specific, unique way from other dogs. And it's interesting when people say to me, you know, but aren't all dogs the same within a breed? Well, no, they're not. Every dog, regardless of what breed they are, regardless of what dog is in within that breed, is unique. Um, and genetic is genetics very responsible for, for learning. Hormones, hormones again, testosterone, um, oxytocin, all of these hormones, cortisol, helps uh, will either inhibit learning or will facilitate learning, as well as neurotransmitters, what's going on inside your dog's head, the levels of serotonin, the levels of dopamine, um, the levels of chemicals in your dog's brain and, and body will really either help dogs learn or will shut down the learning process. Senses. The way your dog perceives the world through senses. Your dog's life experience. What the, the, the experiences that your dogs have had, your dog has had since it was a puppy, whether it has been in your home or not, will really define um, how they learn, what kind of learners they are. And they also learn from life. So remember, dogs don't just learn when you're teaching them. They also learn every minute of the day too. And they're also watching you all the time, so be careful what you do. Conditioning. Offering conditioning whereby if uh, a dog sits and I give the dog a, a reward and then it realizes that actually each time it puts its bottom on the ground it gets a reward, that's conditioning um, the dog into learning that a certain action means there's going to be a certain consequence. But also conditioning as in classical conditioning. For example, um, you know, my dogs, when I open the drawer that contains their leashes and they hear that door, drawer open, they know that a walk is about to come. So I've classically conditioned them um, that whenever they hear that noise, that noise is a precursor to a walk. Social learning. Dogs learn not just from you, but they learn from other dogs. They learn from about the environment around them. And that's really important too. And they also learn from I I imitation. They see dogs doing something and they do it themselves. For example, Jasmine came into our home six months old. Um, she didn't really like grass, but she saw Sadie eat grass, so she started to eat grass. And now they both like eating grass, even though it's a behavior I find particularly annoying, especially sometimes when it makes them vomit. Um, we've now successfully been able to curb it, but 
um, that's the kind of imitation that, that a lot of dogs will learn from others. Um, how do you encourage the learning process? You find what motivates your dog. And that could be food, or toys, or praise, or play, or life rewards. For example, what I mean is the dog has to sit before you open the door, and the dog realizes that the only way you're going to open the door is if it sits. Um, but by opening, the, if it sits and you open the door, it means it can get outside and have fun outside or go for a walk. So find whatever motivates your dog and make learning fun. Remember, it's not about yanking and cranking them. If the dog's walking in front of you, boom, you jerk up on the leash or you put a shot collar or a prong collar on it to get it to stop barking. No, you can make learning fun whether you're teaching a dog to do something or you're changing around a really anxiety-based, fear-based behavior such as aggression. Try and make that learning as fun as possible. And that means you're not going to get bored either. I mean, it's no fun just having a dog just sitting there getting your dog to sit 500 times a day. Make it fun. Make it a game. Make it play. Be clear and consistent with what you're saying. Okay, so consistency, lack of consistency, right. Let's say you're in the household. Um, somebody, two people in the house love that the dog sits on the sofa. But one person in the house doesn't want the dog to sit on the sofa. So sometimes the dog's allowed on the sofa and sometimes it's told off when it's on the sofa. Well, is it allowed or not? Try and be consistent with whoever you live with so that it's clear for your dog. Because inconsistency can really cause insecurity. And also, when you're teaching dogs, you know, and you're teaching dogs to do simple cues like... Um, sit or lie down, don't keep on saying sit, 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 because that's just going to fuse a dog, confuse a dog. Use a word, sit, and if the dog doesn't comply, take the food away or take the treat away or take the toy away, whatever motivator, and present it again a couple of seconds later and ask your dog to sit again. Um, continue this, continue it until your dog makes that connection, but don't just keep on saying sit, 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 because then your dog really will not understand what you're going on about. That's my phone going, but we'll just ignore it. Um, observe your dog and learn what body and vocal signals mean. I mean, we did a little bit this with Niles, but isn't it incredible when you see how a dog communicates Niles with his eyes and his mouth and his teeth and his paws and his body? I mean, this this dog was communicating. And when you really understand what your dog's physical and vocal language is all about, man, it makes teaching them easier. Take time to discover your dog's emotional and sensory experience. This is what positive training is all about. It's not just about teaching a dog to sit and stay and come to you. It's about understanding your dog's sensory experience, your dog's emotional life, how it perceives the world around it. The power of food, I want to talk a little bit about this, because the power of food, again, for those people who say, oh, you should never use food in training, never use food, it's just bribery, they don't understand how powerful food is. So, food um, promotes reward-driven learning. And when I say that, Let's just take a scenario, right? You present a piece of food in front of your dog's nose. What happens in your dog's brain is incredible. That even without eating the food, it's the anticipation of the food that increases the levels of a neurotransmitter called dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is responsible for reward-driven learning, for feelings of pleasure. For, um, for modulating emotion, for feeling good about something. So your dog doesn't even have to eat the food to have that level of dopamine heightened in the brain. And you change your dog from into seeking mode. It's going to smell and seek out this food in anticipation of eating it. Well, what happens it's not just great to motivate your dog to learn. Um, 
but it also changes the dog's brain chemistry. And this is especially important with dogs that are frightened or that have fear. Because food is incompatible with fear. So let's say I have a dog that's lunging aggressively on the leash. And it's because it's fearful of people or other dogs walking past. If I want to change that dog's perception or the way the dog feels about that approaching dog or person, and I introduce food into the mix, I change that fear very quickly from fear to seek mode. Because remember, I, I, the, the food is put near the dog's nose, the dog smells it, the levels of dopamine rise in the dog's brain and takes over and almost squashes the fear component. So when dogs are very emotional, they can't learn. But when dogs are learning, they don't have any time to be emotional. And remember, aggression, for example, is a really emotionally based behavior, apart from predatory aggression. But most aggression is very emotionally driven. So you can literally turn, you can literally change the way the brain works by presenting food and changing the dog from being an emotional, fearful wreck into seek mode, learning mode, and thinking mode. That's why food is so powerful. But you don't want to always carry food around with you, do you? So therefore, using it intermittently, once the dog has learned something, beginning to phase it out and using it intermittently, sure you can do that. You don't always have to carry it with you. But don't never then reinforce the dog. Sometimes you're going to do it and sometimes you're not going to do it with food. The dog never knows when it's going to come, but it might just come the next time you do it. So that actually encourages the dog to work even harder and to learn even faster because the anticipation that food might be just around the corner. I use multi-motivators. There are some dogs that don't like food. Fine. They love toys, though. But hey, there are some dogs that don't like squeaky toys. They like toys that um, are rubber instead. So I'll use a rubber toy. Or they don't like rubber toys. They'll like the squeaky toy. So I'll use a squeaky toy instead. Or they will like the soft toy. Um, I'll use that. I find whatever motivates that dog. Some dogs, like my Sadie, is very motivated by praise. Just that connection we have. That's what she loves. Some dogs are motivated by petting. Some dogs are motivated by all the promise of a walk. So these are life rewards. And sometimes I, I'll use a food, praise, play combination. It doesn't matter. Whatever motivates the dog to learn and be happy. We mustn't negate the dog's cognitive experience. Now, this is a, not a new idea, but it's really a concept that hasn't, I think, been given enough weight. And cognition really is the way your dog's mind processes the world around it. Um, and when you understand your dog's cognitive abilities, that dog's ability to learn and to think and to problem solve, um, you can really find out what kind of learner your dog is and how intelligent your dog is. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that little thing. Oh dear. Let's see. I'll get rid of that too. Oh no. No, I don't want to leave the webinar. Oh well, that's that's fine. That's better. Um, you can really find out how intelligent your dog is. And so I want to tell you something um, about um, this amazing new thing called Dognition. Um, Dognition is the brainchild of, of Dr. Brian Hare from Duke University. And Dr. Brian Hare, if you have um, read his great book called The Genius of Dogs, get it by um, Brian Hare and Vanessa Woods. Get it, read it, um, absorb it. Um, they're really talking about, yes, you can teach your dogs through what they call behaviorism. They don't like behaviorism very much, but they understand, you know, about offering conditioning, classical conditioning, and um, about how dogs learn. But you can also, you mustn't negate your dog's cognitive experience. 
And actually, all of the sort of the um, great research that's been done, you can now do with your own dog in your own home. If you go to dognition.com, you'll be able to find more information. But Dognition really helps you understand what motivates your dog and what influences behavior. And you can learn by doing a series of really fun games and science-based games and tests. You can really learn your dog's cognitive style. And it can tell you about what kind of learner your dog is. Does your dog learn better in a social group? Does your dog learn better in uh, an environment which is more calm? Um, is your dog more of a, a, an independent kind of learner? Or does your dog need to look at you and get cues from you in order to learn? How does your dog problem solve? How does your dog think? And I think that's where positive training is so fabulous because it encourages your dog to think and problem solve. I don't want to impose my will upon the dog. I, for example, Sadie, if I was teaching her to sit, I'd literally put a treat in front of her nose and just wait and wait for her to put her bottom on the ground. Then I'd give her the food. I want her to think and to problem solve. How am I going to get this piece of food out of this woman's hand? And then she gives me something that I like and she gets it. And then she begins to make the connection. I love that. I teach dogs like that all the time, how to problem solve. It's also about um, choice training. Um, choice training is really important um, about really observing your dog and observing the choices that your dog makes and either rewarding those choices or redirecting poor choices onto something that you would like the dog, the better choice. Um, and so really giving some dogs some autonomy. Wow, that sounds strange, I know. Shouldn't we always be controlling our dogs? Well, you know what? You can really enhance your dog's intelligence and learning abilities by giving them a bit of autonomy. It also can make dogs really confident, especially when I give a fearful dog like Niles. Niles, um, the, the fearful chihuahua that you saw there in the video, um, wasn't being dominant. He wasn't being dominant. As I said, he was just he was sick of the fact that Karen stroked him all the time. Remember, this woman had only ever had cats. But with Niles, she got this chihuahua because it was the same size as a cat, and she stroked him and 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 didn't stop. And eventually Niles said, I've had enough. I don't want you near me. And so that relationship became very compromised. Well, I gave Niles some more freedom. I gave him a certain amount of autonomy. I told Karen to back off. I told her not to touch him at all. When she wanted to take him out on, on a walk, all we did, I put the leash on that dog in two seconds. How? I walked past him and I just put a little flip leash over his, over his head and took him out. And when we were outside, he was so distracted, then I could put a regular harness on him um, because I don't like work, walking dogs on slip leashes. Um, but sometimes in shelters and stuff, you need them to get to move dogs quickly. Um, and, and then we just reattached. We put a harness on and put the leash on and, and he was much better. But taking all of that pressure, that spatial awareness that he had, um, and telling her to back off, within two weeks, their relationship was so much better because she stopped stroking him and gave him some space and gave him autonomy. And when sometimes you give a fear, fearful dog some control over its destiny, it then becomes more confident. And so six weeks later, within two weeks, Karen was able to touch her dog again. And within six weeks, there were no issues. That's the kind of success story that I like. It doesn't matter with a chihuahua. It's more dangerous with a Doberman, of course, but the same things can, can uh, same thing would um, be right for a, a large breed dog as well. Um, I think it's really important to understand your dog does have emotions. Yes, emotions are biological reactions to environment, but really feelings are our human interpretations of emotions. So whilst we know beyond shadow of a doubt dogs have emotions, we can't exactly say how they feel, but we have an idea. Remember when I said, when you get excited, do you sometimes jump up and down and you make a lot of noise? When you go to a football game or you go to a baseball game, I see people all the time getting up, leaping up, making a lot of noise. That's what our dogs do when they're excited. So actually, their outward expressions of the way they feel are very similar to us. So therefore, we've got an idea of potentially how these dogs feel. Can they be jealous? Yes, I think they can. Um, a dog that doesn't 
like their own as to hug what's to get in between them. But really, when you have the, the definition of jealousy as sort of loss of that of 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 a person's undivided attention, or um, I think dogs can be jealous. I, I definitely think if a person's touching one dog and the other dog comes and causes a fight, it's because that dog doesn't want that attention on another dog. They want that attention for themselves. And I think that that is the definition of jealousy. But guilt. Um, the jury's out on this one still, even though there are more studies being done. But really, in order to feel guilty, you have to have a sense of self-awareness. Um, you have to be aware. Um, it's called theory of mind. You have to be mindful of how your behavior affects others. And um, this, we don't know if dogs are aware of how their behavior affects others. Are they really aware that they make you feel happy or they make you feel sad? Or do they really care if one steals a bone from the other? Do they really understand how their behavior impacts others? Um, there are studies, as I said, that are being done, um, but at the moment we feel that dogs don't, that don't have the capacity to feel guilt. Um, and the guilty look that you might get as you come through the door at the end of the day and see your pillows being chewed and then you're angry is literally just a response to body language and your vocal cues at that time. Um, remember, dogs are very good at reading us. Um, and so therefore, I really don't think dogs are spiteful. Again, Niles peeing on the bed, I wasn't spite. I was just anxious. And you'll find that dog, a lot of dogs with separation anxiety, they will, um, when their owner goes away, they might mark the bed um, or a shoe or, or something and that's because that object smells of that person that's just an expression of their anxiety so please if your dog does toilet somewhere don't rub, don't rub your dog's nose in it it'll be exactly the same as if your child um, had an accident and you took your kid's face and rubbed um, your kid's face in its, its excrement or um, its urine it, I mean that's just you're not going to do that are you if you did that it would be abusive so please don't do that with your dog either um, we're nearly at the end. We're nearly at the end, but we cannot go through the seminar without sensory education. And this is my my new kind of world. This is uh, I, I love this new phrase that I've come up with, sensory education, because it is teaching through the senses. It's about learning, um, teaching your dog to learn and be more confident with scent games, for example. Remember, as I said, food very powerful. There's a great activity out there called nose work that um, you can do. Um, you can go on their website and nose work is all about teaching your dog to discover scents and um, seek out and hunt out different kinds of smells. It's exactly like how you teach detection dogs um, and sniffer dogs and dogs to detect drugs and bombs and all kinds of things. Um, nose work is great, but if you don't want to do that activity, you can just do scent work in your home hiding food around your home and getting your dogs to go seek and discover or putting food in toys or you know I never feed my dogs through bowls anymore I feed them through activity toys because that whole idea of having that toy and they've got to work out how to get the food out of the toy it takes them much longer to eat and it's a great training opportunity that I don't miss and after half an hour of getting the food out of the toy they're exhausted and then they sleep so it's all about enriching your dog's life through um, and teaching your dogs using sensory education, the power of the nose. But it's also um, the um, auditory learning, um, which is harnessing the power of sound. Um, you might have, have seen on my website, um, and again, you can go to my website, which is positively.com, and learn more about it, um, something called the Canine Noise Phobia Series. Um, you'll see on the bottom right-hand side that I have a calming um, CD and I also have these CDs that are will help dogs get over thunderstorm phobia, fireworks, and city sounds. There are a lot of CDs out there that have the sound effects on them, but the, what makes these completely unique is that this is the only CD out there that's been matched with music that has been clinically demonstrated to calm dogs. So in the calming CD. Um, is used in shelters, in people's homes, in cars, everywhere to calm dogs down, to help dogs that have separation anxiety. And um, calming music, we know that the music played 
one single instrument at a very low um, a low frequency, played in a very calm way, does have a calming effect on dogs. But when you marry that with progressive sound effects of a noise that a dog fears, you can actually change around the way uh, a dog's fear of noise. But what's also great about these is it also can prevent phobias from occurring. So if you want to find out more about how auditory learning um, is so important and how it can really influence behavior for dogs that suffer, uh, for puppies to dogs that suffer with anxiety and fear and aggression issues, then really this this um, canine noise phobia series and the calming is really groundbreaking and, and, and take a look and see what you think. We've had uh, amazing success with it. Um, and this is dog TV. You might have heard about dog TV, but this is another thing I'm involved with. So we're seeing this, yes, it's television for dogs. Is that crazy? Is that cookie? Well, maybe you might think so, but actually, it's fascinating. And it's becoming more available here in the United States. Go on, go on and, and Google it, dog TV. You'll find out more about it. But really, it's television that's been specially calibrated for dogs. And I'm on the advisory panel. And the reason why I became part of the advisory panel is because I was looking for more tools to help dogs that have separation anxiety and that have problems with being by themselves during the day. Not that I advocate, advocate dogs should be by themselves all day. There's just another tool in my trainer's box in order to be able to um, give dogs that auditory comfort that they need, that visual comfort that they need. Um, and Dog TV does that. So I'm not going to go on too much more about it, but Google it and find it. And if you can get it in your area, get it because we're having, again, great results. Um, and it really understands your dog. And the people that have developed it aren't just people that are wanting a gimmick and wanting to make a buck. Um, they, they are people who have really done a lot of very, very great research um, and have been helped by Tufts University in Boston and Dr. Nicholas Godman, um, who is a wonderful veterinary behaviorist. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, and again, we talked a lot about this, but where positive training, people say that positive training, and a lot of the, the naysayers about positive training, as I said in the beginning of this webinar, that it can't help dogs with aggression. Um, and it can. Because when you really understand what aggressive behavior is all about, I, I teach aggressive. I, I'm now I'm an aggression expert. I have been for many, many years. That's all really the cases I see now is, is aggression cases. Um, and from the, the very small dogs to the very large dogs. And I would say 98% of the cases that I've seen in the last 15 years of training um, are from dogs that have been fearfully aggressive. The, it, the aggression might look dominant, it's certainly controlling, but it's not coming from a real place of confidence. The root of it is fear. Whether it looks like the dog is confident now because it's seen that its aggressive behavior has worked, it still started that aggressive behavior because of insecurity. Yes, I have trained a couple of dogs, or I have met a couple of dogs that, more than a couple of dogs, but some dogs that have neurological issues that are aggressive or, or that are um, predatory aggressive, that have predatory aggression, which is really a non-emotionally based aggression, aggressive behavior. But um, really aggressive behavior addresses a dog's need to increase distance from a perceived danger. And there's various ways they can do it, like Niles. Niles started off with just very subtle behaviors, subtle language, but because Karen didn't see them, he just went on and on and on and progressed and so she really understood his language which is bite and then he realized his biting actually had the desired effect that she would go away from him so then he just kept using it and then he became confident more confident that his aggressive behavior was working but really it's when when dogs are being aggressive they're not really intending to harm as much as they're intending to make you go away but you put them in a position where they might have to harm you yes are there some dogs out there that are so behaviorally compromised they just want to harm you in a big way? Yes, there are. Are there dogs out there that are very dangerous? Yes, there are. And in my um, in my 15 years as a trainer, I've had about um, three, four, three or four dogs that I've recommended for euthanasia because they've been so incredibly dangerous. Um, as a trainer, I have absolute responsibility um, to keep people safe, to keep the public safe. 
and to keep other dogs safe too. So even though I haven't recommended it much, sometimes I, you know I've recommended it publicly, and that's got me a whole load of people that said you shouldn't have ever put this dog down. But um, I don't do it lightly, and there are some dogs that um, that are are dangerous. Having said that, I work with very successively with a lot of aggressive dogs, a lot of severely aggressive dogs, and we have great results. So um, if if your dog has a, an aggressive issue, then uh, there is stuff you can do. Uh, and this is really why dogs aggress. Again, genetics plays a big part, but health. There are so many dogs that aggress because they're in pain, and yet trainers don't understand it. Even positive trainers sometimes just don't get it. Um, that's why I think you know I would encourage you to seek out things like T Touch, um, Linda Tellington Jones, Sarah Fisher, amazing T Touch practitioner, uh, and um, and behavioral uh, behavioral and uh, behaviorist and trainer in Britain. Um, that just shows you about how you can understand how your dog is holding its body if the aggression is through pain. The presence of testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, sex, that's very um, important and indicative of uh, potentially if there is an aggression, aggressive problem. The nervous system, the lack of socialization, inappropriate play, predatory behavior, redirection, protecting resources, stress, anxiety, and fear. and um, I, tomorrow I'll be going down to Miami where we are having one of my dog bite conferences in Miami if you want to go on my website positive.com to find out about that conference it's all about aggression it's all about um, how to prevent it how to treat it how to keep kids safe um, so if you're in the Miami area um, just google the um, Miami dog bite conference and please do join us it's a great day of uh, listening to me speak about it, Jim Crosby, who's a canine aggression expert, Claudine Wilkins, who's a lawyer, some great families that we've got coming there to talk about their experiences. It's a really great, and it's open to to everybody. So if you're in the Florida area or Miami, there's still time, and, and I'd love to, to see you. Um, so really, we're going to end with a simple question. What kind of relationship do you want with your dog? I'll tell you what I want. I want my dogs to follow me because they want to, not because they're afraid of what will happen to them if they don't. And that's it, bottom line. And it doesn't matter what kind of dog you have. You can have your dog follow you without the use of force, just by teaching it in the right way. If you're having issues and you need to find a trainer in your area, then please go to my website, positivity.com slash trainers. I have one of the first, um, well, it really is, the first networks of purely positive training trainers that um, have been perfect, personally endorsed by me and assessed by me. They go through a rigorous application process. Um, and these are the creme de la creme. And you know that when you get a trainer coming into your home, these trainers are going to use humane methods with your dog, regardless of the issue your dog is having. And humane methods with you, I might add. Um, they're going to come into your home and they're going to help you. And we have, as I said, some trainers in America, um, trainers in Britain, um, in Greece, and in Italy. And we're also looking for more trainers. So if you're a trainer out there and you want to become part of our team, it's a great team. Um, and we, uh, it's very exciting. Also, if you don't have a trainee in your area, we're going to be starting from May the 15th phone consultations. So it doesn't matter where you are, you'll be able to, teach, uh, to, to have a session with a Victoria Still Positive Dog Trainer. And as I said, these people are really the very, very best. Um, a lot of what I've spoken about, but more, and more incredible facts and tips and more training tips, are in my new book that came out on March the 19th, Train Your Dogs Positively. Um, and I really encourage you to read it because, again, it goes through the debate, but it, it really tells you some more incredible things about your dog that you might not know and about how to make communication e easier and about how to be a more effective teacher. Um, and, you know, I think it's really it's, it's, a, it's a great size. You can put it in your bag, take it around with you, and I hope that you'll be able to learn um, more from just reading the book. If you want to follow me, please, as I go to positive.com. I'm always on my Facebook every day. Yes, it is me. I do have an administration, but I really am on there every day. And I like to talk to people there. So please join me on my Facebook. I also tweet 
it's, uh, it's me or the dog. Um, and if you want to find out about more about my method and watch videos of how I do it, please go to youtube.com slash ehowpets and you'll be able to find out about, uh, about how I do things. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you um, for uh, Doggington for putting on this. I so appreciate you asking me and I'm sorry that I've gone on for longer than I thought I would, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Okay, so um, Victoria, thank you so, so much. This was outstanding. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the time. And I want you to know that virtually every single person stayed with you all the way through. All Thanks. right, so as I switch everyone back, um, I'm, I'm sorry I stepped over you. You there. No, I just wanted to say thank you, Harlan, too. So let's get you all ready um, and get your get your uh, question fingers ready because I'm going to have a question for you. It's now time. Get ready to type in your question. Here we go. And it's a simple question based on um, something that Victoria said today. So if you were paying attention, you know the answer. Okay, so according to what Victoria taught today, why do dogs walk in front of us on a leash? Why do dogs walk in front of us on a leash? First person. Oh my gosh, I got this. Whoa, you guys are like. Um, okay, and the first. Oh my gosh. The first person is Cat Camplin. Cat Camplin. All right, Cat Camplin, you are the winner. What we'd like you to do is we'd like you to email us at info at doggingtonpost.com with your name and address, Cat Camplin, and Mer we'll get that over to our, our friends over at Merrick, and they will get you your voucher for a free 25 pound bag of their new grain-free real Texas beef dry dog food. And also, Kat, double your luck, because in your name, Merrick is going to donate a, a bag to National Mill Dog Rescue. Join Merrick on Facebook at facebook.com Merrick Pet Care. And every time I say Merrick, my little pet Pomeranian Calva looks up thinking, is it time for me to eat again? So uh, we, we hope to see you back tomorrow. It was an amazing, amazing day. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us.